we will be putting it on the CVA website if um, if people want to um, go back to look at it or share it with other people to get um, to share the information that we'll learn here today. All right. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the chat here. Oh, it's transcribing what I'm. <laughs> All right, great. So I'm going to start uh, with the land acknowledgement and then um, I'll introduce our guests and then we'll get right into it. OK. So as an organization within MSU Denver, uh, oh, sorry, as an organization within MSU Denver, CVA acknowledges the indigenous people in the land of Auraria and the broader Denver area. We honor and acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations. This area was also the site of trade, hunting, gathering, and healing for many other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as the original stewards of the land. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land on which we gather. We also acknowledge the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who worked the stolen land for the colonists and who continue to disproportionately face economic oppression, racism, violence, and exploitation. Lastly, we wanna recognize the communities and families of Auraria displaced by the creation of this campus for MSU Denver to have a place that we now call home. We share this acknowledgement to encourage all of us here to consider how our work in this space and our daily lives can address these historic and contemporary atrocities. All right, great. Um, I'm so happy to see everybody here and I'm hoping that I'm getting everybody um, let in um, as we go. If I pause, it's because I'm I'm letting somebody into the chat or into the um, meeting. Um, all right, so um, welcome to Art and Work. Uh, this is our second installation. Um, online because of snow in February of 2023 in Denver, Colorado. Um, we have three industrial designers with us today, um, and I'm ask, gonna ask them just quickly to introduce themselves, maybe talk specifically, say your job title and just a brief couple of minutes. Then I'm going to um, highlight each of them and they're each gonna talk about some of the work that they do. Um, and then we'll have some time for a little discussion between the panelists and some questions at the end um, for um, everybody in attendance. Um, and as a note, I expect my Art and Action Lab students to have some excellent questions. So um, be prepared. All right, David, why don't you introduce yourself first, please? Okay, hello everyone. I'm David Klein and I'm a professor of industrial design at MSU Denver. I've been there for a long time. Uh, we have a Bachelor of Science degree in industrial design. Uh, before that, I was teaching at University of Illinois. That's in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, that's a really good school uh, for design. A lot of um, uh, connections with companies in Chicago. And before that, I was a designer at um, Samsung. Um, we pronounce it Samsung. It's in Korea, so it's a Korean company, Samsung. I think you say Samsung here, uh, Consumer Electronics. And before that, I designed some toys for a company called Roadmaster. Um, not real high-end stuff, but some toys and also fitness equipment that was sold at uh, JCPenney. That's a store that I don't know if they exist anymore. <laughs> think so, and uh, stuff like that. Then uh, before that, I worked as a model maker. I did architectural models and some product prototypes, and um, I got my master's degree from Illinois and my bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University a long, long time ago. Awesome, great, thanks, David. Um, Eric, I'll have you go next. Uh, my name is Eric Heimbach, and currently I'm an industrial designer here at LTM Plastics. This is my office. Um, I graduated from Metro with an industrial design degree in 2017, late 2017. Um, and had, I'm going to go through kind of my past experience in detail, but um, I've had everything from working at a 3D printing store. Um, I moved to Seattle, worked at Teague, which is a design firm for Boeing as a technical designer, so a little more on the engineering side. Um, and then came back here, worked for MTM Motorworks and did uh, some motorcycle related design work, electric motorcycles, um, and then I got this job here at LTM Plastics. And I am uh, essentially uh, the lead designer here and the only designer here uh, where I take 
clients requests and create designs or make modifications. Uh, we also do some in-house design and production here and behind the wall. There's uh, some big injection molding machines, so we have the whole factory here as well. So kind of design and manufacturing here in Denver, which is pretty cool for me. Yeah. Thank you. And Lily. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Cornett, and I saw that question in the chat about the degree. So I just I graduated from the ID program. Dave was my professor for Beginning Studio. He helped me get my first internship sketching at a design consultancy in Denver called Hexhead, um, which was brief, but that helped segue to the job I have currently. Um, I graduated from Metro in 2019, and then that fall, I started working at Thule as a product designer. I've been there for three and a half years now, and I design soft goods in Longmont. I work on a team of four, um, and we are actually a Sweden-based company, so we work in a satellite office where anything that's sewn, any of our bags, uh, luggage, packs, all that of that is designed here in Colorado. And we do a lot of interfacing with our Sweden team as well as our Asia team. We have developers and factories in Asia. This is my cat. Um, and uh, I'm here in my home office. I work from home about two days a week. And uh, yeah, and I'm super psyched to be here. And I'd like to show you some of my work later. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and we were expecting Enso Kim, who works for Kid Robot and does toy design. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't make it today, uh, but I will find a way for her to come and um, share her story with us as well at another time. So um, yeah, so we're going to dig in. So the um, the run of this will be David will kind of give us an introduction. Eric will talk about um, what he does, and then Lily well, everybody will talk about what they do, but then Lily will wrap us up with what she does, as well as some really good questions that are facing the industry um, that will um, bring up some more conversation. So that's the the logic behind um, uh, pacing everybody. And um, David, I think I'll hand it over to you. Maybe the rest of us can turn. Oh, oh you're going to share your screen. Never mind. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll share my screen and I've got a timer here, so I put it on for 14 minutes. So, Great. Uh, for, 14 minutes. Yeah. Anyway. See what we got. Da, 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 da. Okay, getting there. Coming up, and I'll go big. So I um the way this monitor is, I can just see you, Katie, and okay. I'll keep it that way. But let me know if there's any questions. You can just chime in and ask me. So that was a good question. Yeah, what's the degree? And um, I have an MFA, that's Master of Fine Art, and my bachelor is actually Bachelor of Fine Art. It's called Bachelor of Fine Art in Product Design. So that tells you product design is kind of another name for industrial design. So I put it parentheses here, and it also has to do with invention. That's why I also put it there. Um, but you'll find industrial design programs um, within schools of engineering um, at the uh, at um, MSU Denver. It's in with professional studies uh, with engineering engineering and group like that so that and it's a bachelor of science so it's a more technical aspect um, most programs are in art departments some of them are in architecture uh, as well so that was a really good question <clears throat> okay so people ask oh what is design and a lot of people it's uh oh you design factories or you design industries right so it uh, makes sense because interior designer designs interior fashion designs fashion and so on. So industrial design must in, uh, design industries, right? No, that's not what we design, but it's close. Then there is some reason for industrial in the title because all of the objects, and I put this sideways just to fit more, are designed, are uh, produced in the factory. So they're designed um, at the table or in the shop and we figure out how to make things and we use the computer, but um, vacuum cleaner, guitar, automobile, chairs, um, lighting, uh, medical equipment and toys. Really nowadays, almost everything you buy is mass produced in the factory somewhere, right? So um, we're really a long way from um, handcraft. So on the left is a image of someone making ceramics. Maybe some of you have that a uh, clay and it's real. Um, uh therapeutic and really like uh, your hands are really dictating the shape of that and that's how things were made for a long time and now on the right we have 3d printing of ceramic 
and um, it's a similar material. It's going through a nozzle there and kind of add it up. And now you can kind of see there's a little texture on there. You can do a little more um, complexity with it with machines maybe. There's some capabilities that the hands are not able to do. So uh, we as designers, we have to understand so many um, different kinds of fabrication techniques. And not to fully understand the detail. So like upper left is extrusion and the bottom left is um, plastic injection molding. You see those plastic forks and that's how things are made. We have to understand how parts can be made in these different processes in a general way. Then we consult with an engineer who knows this stuff a lot better than us. So um, don't be intimidated that, that you have to be a materials expert. Um, we have a couple of classes in this and you just need to know um, good enough. Another thing design is, design is how it works. So a lot of people think that, um, oh, design is just how something looks. Oh, they're designer jeans or designer whatever, it's just how it looks. But as you get into products, it's also about how it works and um, how it works, how it operates, how it works within the business, how it works within society. And that term design, um, without saying industrial, industrial design is designed for fabrication, but design could be um, graphic, um, product, and business like that, right? So this is a really good book. Actually, I recommend you could probably find it pretty cheap. It's a few years old now, but it profiles some companies and a few of the projects that are in there. And I love this because it's a, such a different things that um, industrial designers work on. So headphones, that's um, the wider group. There's consumer electronics, so Bluetooth speaker, headphones, things like that. Um, kitchen appliances, so it could be like a toaster, toaster oven, blender. This is a potato peeler. It has a big handle on it. And then we have automobile. Um, automobile is kind of a special thing um, that um, that's called transportation designers design that. So you go to special school, but they also employ industrial designers. It's a team effort. Industrial designers will work on the interior and some of the details, right? And the transportation designer design the whole thing. So this gives you an idea of the realm, the range of things industrial designers uh, work on. And there's a wide range of things I can show just products all day, grab them around me and show you. Uh, but what do they have in common? Um, and I don't know if the can we have participation? Can anybody ch answer? It's a, so, quite diverse things, but and there's three or four things um, or four things. Maybe all products have in common for industrial design. And uh, what do you guys think? Feel free to either use the chat word or, or um, your microphone. They're all electrical. And Gabe says, "Oh, electrical, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them do. Um, but I'll I'll move through. But one thing that I mentioned, um, they're all mass produced. So, um, no one sits and like makes a watch anymore, or a light, or a drill, right? So they're all mass produced. And I already said that, I guess. But um, so we do understand um these ways of making things, and not just plastic. In fact, we really." I would say nowadays we really need to reduce the plastic. It's going to the garbage and the ocean and everywhere, but it's amazing material that can do a lot of things. And so it's gonna be continued to use, be used. But um, slip casting, this is really nice ceramic piece. And you see the mold on the top right. So this one, um, somebody makes it out of plaster and the mold is out of plaster and then it's glazed and it's a ceramic object, but it's made over and over. So this is kind of that um, handcraft that goes to industrial, um, this is forging, so a piece of metal goes in. You might recognize this as like a bicycle crank that goes on a bicycle, but it comes out of here, and this is called flash. There's extra metal, and then that's trimmed off. Um, so there's a lot of work behind the um, parts that you see that are made in factories. Um, another thing is they're all used by people. So almost every design, um, you sit in it or you use it or you hold it. So we study people. That's the field of ergonomics. Uh, ergonomics is the measure of people. So uh, Henry Dreyfus and some others through history, and the people continue to do it. They measure people doing all different things, standing and sitting, talking on the phone, um, driving a forklift, and they figure out all that. So there is a little bit of science, and you write down the numbers. Um, it, uh, ergonomics is the measure of people. And then human factors is, oh, can you understand things that you see? So like your apps and uh, vision and things like that. Um, so this, a, a part of this is also observational research. So in order to design something, you might not know about it really yourself. So you have to go and watch people using it. If it's a lawnmower or snowblower or a chair or any of the simplest thing, this is a blow dryer. So this is a design project I found. And if you look on the left, the design the designer went around to um, hair salons and see how they hold it. So, oh, how do they use the handle? 
and they wonder how to use the handle and look at the hands, no one's using the handle. So the design's gonna be different because of observational research. And on the right, there's a lot of foam mock-ups, just any shape and figuring out which one's best. And this is the one they kind of ended with. Basically, it's one big handle, right? It's kind of curved shape, so I just hold it. And uh, that's a good uh, example of observational research applied to design. This is another project that the designers looked at um, some people in the wheelchairs. So there was a, um, a lady that came to us. She was in a wheelchair, and she's in a group of uh, wheelchair people, and they want some protection from the rain and snow. So these are the products that are out there now, and don't they seem kind of dangerous? So they ask a lot of people in wheelchair, how do you move your hand? Um, what do you like? What do you don't like? Um, do you want to be able to store it away? And then uh, they made some little mock-ups like this that if you can tell the pink one, it kind of folds up like accordion and the other one folds back and they make some little models like this and test them. Another thing designs have in common, they're all functional and they do something. Uh, we can say they solve a problem, okay? The problem of peeling a potato, the problem of sitting and all of that, right? And it might not be an incredible problem, like huge, but it's a small problem. Uh, so that's differentiates it from art um, in a sense, right? That's a kind of more functional driven. So um, these are tools for the kitchen, potato peeler. They have bigger handles, um, slicing bread. Uh, another thing about them is they all look cool. They all look good. Um, a longer word than cool is like aesthetic, right? So um, we can say, oh, they're aesthetically refined. And this is where design has um, a lot of crossover with art. So that concern of color, um, the sewing machine on the bottom right or any of these really can be considered a sculpture in a way. Um, the top right is an ergonomic bicycle handle. So if you can imagine when you're on that uh, bike handle, it's really on the uh, meat of your hand. And then uh, mountain biking, you kind of grab it from the side sometimes. So then it really um, grips good there. But also it looks really cool and like a sculpture, right? So sculpture, color, um, surface texture, negative space, and all of that stuff. So um, that's why you get a degree in art. So you can do this kind of really um, fast when you're developing your designs along with research. Another important aspect is um, something new, right? There's no reason to design just another chair. We have so many chairs. So what's the reason of the next chair? It has a cup holder. It has a good back support. It has wheels on it or whatever. Um, and that's um, innovation. So the chair has already been invented. The light has already been invented, but if I put a handle on it, that's innovation. Or if I have a new kind of blow dryer, I mean, that's actually an innovation because it's a total. Have you guys used the Dyson blow dryer? I remember when that came out and it's just totally different. So we have um, innovation and invention. This is a new kind of chair I found online. I thought it's pretty cool. Um, you know what this is for? Special use? I guess it kind of shows there. I'll go up to the next slide. It's for elderly people or anyone. Um, and you might not think about it, but they have trouble um, getting in and out of a chair. So they actually make chairs with motors in them that kind of lift up like the motor to get the person out. But if you look at this, he puts his hand on the handle there and it kind of lean forward and, it, and then he can get out of the chair. Um, I thought it's pretty cool. It has a friendly look to it and it's kind of nice. Um, so in, the, in, in design, we use um, creative process and it's not really in a line like this. It goes across, but it can go in a circle and keep going. But you have some idea and research. Then you do some sketches and drawings. We'll probably see those uh, from the designers and I'll show you a few. Um, then we have more refined drawings and we have models and prototypes. And then we go to manufacture. That's kind of like the process. So drawing is really with pen and pencil. So a lot of my students and a lot of professional designers they're literally using just like a big ballpoint pen and designing furniture or pots and pans, um, shoes like this, really good. Um, then you're going into computer with uh, Illustrator or other things to do like color and apply like that. Um, this one is some drawings. And then in the middle, uh, these two are like foam models. They're just made out of blue foam with some lines drawn on them. So I can just make them really easy and kind of see if I like to hold them in my hand. Then I can go back and draw them and, and render and make more precise drawings. Um, so this is technical drawing for like an iPhone. It's an older iPhone. So there's a section view and every um, aspect is measured in a given uh, dimension. This is what's called an exploded view, assembly view, it's also called that. And if you can see in the bottom, it's a sport sunglasses. And on the top there, um, the pieces, how they go together, right? So the des designer figures this out and makes a real simple drawing. Um, 
This is a lemon juicer, and on the left, it's the side view. And then if you imagine, if you cut it down the half, down the middle with a laser beam, this is the section view, so it's looking through the inside, so you kind of see the shape of it. Uh, designer has to think about that. Uh, this is an innovative toaster I thought was cool that instead of the toaster going down, it goes through like this. So this designer made a model. Maybe it's a 3D print. It's not real. And then this drawing to kind of show uh, what the pieces are. There's a heater in there and a little motor and the elements of the design, right? So we're using any kind of way, even just tape and cardboard to make a full model to see how things look. Um, then we take that data and go into the computer and uh, render things like a little bit better. But we always want to have like a hands-on thing. So it's hard to design a potato peeler or really anything on the computer. So this is like um, the old potato peeler and coming to the new one. So each one's an iteration. That's called an iteration, one after the other. And you ask people to try it and you see what's better. Um, here's with a crutch. So on the far left is the original one. And on the far right, it's lighter. It's able to adjust and maybe it looks cooler or not. I don't know if anybody really cares what a crutch looks like, but these are iterations showing the development, right? So there's this process of building um, in the lab. Then you make the computer model in the right color. So you don't go right to this. You always uh, work before. And this applies to soft goods. Um, Lily will show some. And this is another student um, that designed really nice um, pack with uh, patterns on there. I'll finish with my projects real quickly. Um, I did some research about eating habits and the breakfast emerged as a really important meal, but a lot of breakfast cereals have so much sugar. So I thought I'm going to make a granola maker and I made this machine. It's like a bread maker, uh, but it makes it granola. And this is the first one I made. Um, then I hired a designer who does really good computer models and he made an updated version like this. Looks really cool. And, um, uh, this is an exploded view showing each of the components. So I used this drawing and I wrote a description and I went and got a patent to the U.S. Patent Office. So that's in the process. It has a um, temporary patent now. And now I have to make the model. And this is a project I'm working on uh, now. Cool. Okay. Awesome. That's my time. Great. Thanks, mm -hmm. David. That was a whirlwind. What is industrial design? And I think we have a really good <laughs> sense now. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to Eric then. All right, I guess. Um, so I'll start off with uh, just the beginning um, of my education, I guess, in college. Uh, I started off uh, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Went to CSU, actually, um, and kind of tried every class that interests me. Nothing really stuck. Um, so kind of last minute I transferred to MSU Denver and, you know, really liked the, the beginning classes with, you know, the hands on work. We had a metals class, we had a woods class and so I made, uh, I made a bike stand, uh, like working my mountain bike with, um, I made a coffee table. So, you know, I figured I, I found kind of my passion right away, uh, with the design program. So. I was kind of fortunate in that sense. And so once I figured that out, I just kind of went straight ahead and dove into it. Um, I got a internship at Five Horizons, which is a textile soft good company. Um, just really, really short internship, but I got to see what the textile and uh, soft goods industry looked like. Um, and at least at that job, a lot of it was you come up with sketches and you put a Photoshop board together um, of an idea. Like we were doing stuff for Carhartt and they needed stuff to throw in for free when you bought like a bigger purchase. So one was like kind of like a water bottle holder and stuff like that. Uh, and then we just sent them off to China, but those sketches and, and they would make it really cheaply and quickly for us. So and I think a lot of Lily will elaborate on their process, but um at least at that firm that's what that's kind of the work process and you just kind of had to turn over things pretty quickly um then i got an internship at uh the 3d printing store and that was a really good experience because i kind of found that i really like working in cad and computer design uh and that's kind of where i excelled so um i got an internship there 
doing uh, prosthetic design for animals, and it was called Posthetics. Pretty <laughs> clever name. Uh, so as you can see, this is my. Let me just. There we go. Okay. So go to Posthetics. So a first project here. So I'm just gonna go through these projects. Um, Giselle was this dog right here, and she needed uh, a rear leg, essentially. So what what they were doing is we would take a we would wrap their legs with a with a cast, and this uh, dotted kind of triangle structure is a three D scan. So I would take. We would take the cast, 3D scan it, and then bring it into the CAD software, and that would work off that and make a design uh, and then test it. And really, it was just all 3D printing, you know, really quick prototypes to figure out what worked and what didn't. Uh, and let me zoom in. So you can see all these different prototypes and uh, ideas we went through. And some industrial designers are really heavy with sketching and sketching up uh, ideas. And so personally, I'm not. And this, you know, I just throw a really rough sketch together. It took two minutes to throw this idea together with a BOA design. Um, and then I go into CAD really quickly and basically print things and get in my hands and see what works and doesn't and just kind of repeat that process. So this is kind of the final design. And I got Boa to donate um, some Boa straps and integrate that design. And the problem was the legs kept sliding off of their fur. It was really hard to clamp down on that. So before they're using Velcro straps. Um, and so we went with Boa and seemed to be pretty successful, at least the first go around. There's still this need to be iterated on. Um, but this was really good experience and it looks, you know, everyone's interested in this. Uh, everyone likes dogs and that helped me get my next job, which was, uh, uh, and here's, they have like a whole Facebook page to want to show guys. So it's, it's kind of fun. I did this leg for a Walter um, and that was with the strap. So Giselle was the, the later design. Um, so after that, I, uh, leveraged my connection. My uncle worked at Boeing at the time. Um, and he knew a guy at Teague and Teague is Boeing's design firm. So up in Everett where they manufacture the 747s, which I guess they don't do anymore. They just finished the, the production run. But uh, this is right outside their campus in Everett, Washington. And this was a crazy you know, change of scenery for me, and it was a job as a technical designer. Um, a technical designer, it's more uh, so they really liked my CAD work. Um, I, I was decent at CAD uh, out of college, so uh, got the job um, as an intern, and then that lasted for six months, and they hired me full time. Um, and that job is really working with think a team of 12 of us, and then you break off into smaller teams like this project here, which is the 777 Next interior mock-up. Uh, this was a team of six, and everyone was kind of split up. So they had this airplane, and they needed this traveling mock-up to go to trade shows around the world uh, and basically sell their new interior design and show off the lighting, um, how the bins work, the space, um, so people could, you know, who are potentially buying these airplanes, they could walk through it. Um, so everything got to work just the way it does on a real airplane, just had to be super cheap to manufacture uh, and it had to be transportable. So I can't show any of the details um, of the CAD work, but this is one example. These are vent panel holders, so right by your feet um, on the, the wall of the, the airplane. There's these vents that have the air conditioning and whatnot, and I had to get them 3D printed. So we make them out of EPS foam. We have this big wire cutter, and that's what this white is, is EPS foam, um, and then just plywood, and, and they had a cool 
strategy of bolting these together so they fit right every time. Uh, so then you can send it to the shop with the drawing and uh, they, they have it, all the information they need and they can assemble and build it really quickly. Um, and because it was a traveling uh, mock-up, it had to you had to take parts off and be able to transport it safely without breaking. And you can imagine these vents, you can kind of see down here in the left corner, uh, it was a 3D print, so it had all these really fragile slats in it. Um, so I made it a way where you had to have it face down, and then this cut out here is where you, the only place you can put your hand to pick it up so you're not accidentally grabbing the printed area. So cool little, uh, you know, things that you had to consider with these projects. And this is kind of, you know, every couple of months or month, we had a new project that was completely different, you know, making these panels or making brackets to hold uh, LED strips that project light over the, the ceilings and whatnot. So, uh, and this is kind of the final, version of that. So that job lasted in only a year, actually, um, and then Boeing had their problems with their airplanes. I'm sure everyone's heard of. And uh, the the max planes, and so budgets got cut um, and I didn't continue working there, so I came back to Denver um, and I don't know. There's many industrial designers here that have been to school a while, but Mike Mayberry uh was a professor of ours me and lily's actually and uh i knew he had connections here so really me getting all these jobs is just leveraging connections and then kind of working hard through them um so this was a project my senior project um these are some sketches from my senior year and <clears throat> Mike was interested in uh, bike design, and so that's kind of what got me to meet with him a few times. Uh, so he was someone in the industry who had connections that I was trying to build. Um, so essentially, as an industrial designer, it's hard to get a job because you can't, you don't have enough experience, and it's hard to get experience if you don't have a job. So basically, what I did after that year at Teague is I I was fortunate enough to live at home, so I didn't have to worry about rent. Um, and I built my own experience. So I was interested in bike design. So, you know, this is in my garage. I cut some pieces of foam together, uh, worked on a folding electric bike, and this is elaborating on my senior project. Uh, so just working through, uh, and the, I'm, all my design was in SOLIDWORKS, which was a program for 3D modeling, and there's some key shot renderings of the more final products. So. Uh, kind of what I learned is to really simplify everything. You know, it's easy to as industrial designers always, you know, not always, but people do tend to complicate things with their ideas. But if you really want to make something, it has to be, you know, pared down to the basic version of it, um, especially if you're doing large manufacturing. So simplifying. Uh, so this job got me, uh, this project got me the next job with Mike, and he ha he had a packed motorcycle that he needed a kickstand for. So, um, and it had he had to make seven of them. This is a really custom bike, uh, which was, this was like a dream project and I was really excited to do this, uh, but I had so much to learn. I didn't know, you know, how to get the angle right for the kickstand and all that. So this really just putting in the hours on my own um, and just testing things out of foam uh and then finally getting the cad so this is the motorcycle rear wheel figuring out where we want the kickstand um how we're going to make it how we're going to produce multiples of them to make it not you know ridiculously expensive because you know even machining and i actually have uh one of the legs right here um so this is a machined aluminum piece uh and this is the leg of the kickstand so these are you know these are a couple hundred dollars a piece but if you simplify it so there's only a couple operations in the cnc machining where it goes around uh it cuts the cost down so that was a consideration of this project and really every project um so yeah doing that 3d prints testing with springs uh getting a foot design and we ended up 3d printing the foot uh and this blue area is continuous strands of carbon fiber so 
that was actually stiff enough to support the motorcycle with a 3D print. Another another cost cutting and kind of interesting take on a kickstand uh, because the shape right here to machine this is hours and hours and you have to have a really skilled person to make a good one and then to repeat that it's really expensive so you know this is probably 10 bucks of material to 3d print it so i had to make a, a drawing for it um we also made jigs for uh the person who's going to actually manufacture and install the kickstand two minutes okay so anyway this is a cool project i, I really enjoyed it um this is the last project I did with Mike, and we designed a motorcycle body kit. So this is a Suron motorcycle. It's a little electric dirt bike, weighs like 100 pounds. And had the first, the biggest issue I had was, uh, you know, we identified a problem with it, and the, the seat wasn't really big enough to ride it like a dirt bike. You have to shift your weight forwards and backwards on the dirt bike all the time. So... We took a seat off another dirt bike, put it on it and realized, oh, OK, this is almost the right size. Let's see what we can do with this. Maybe you can 3D print something. Um, here's some sketches and ideas working through. Uh, again, we three. So my experience of 3D scanning worked with this project. Now we 3D scan the whole motorcycle, the skeleton of it. And I 3D scan the motorcycle seat. You kind of put it together in CAD. Now you get some 3D prints. We did a, you know, the first idea is a 3D printed body kit and it worked and we, we wrote it and tested it. Didn't like the design, had some issues. So we redid the design, was, you know, taped up the bike, see what we liked. Uh, and then this is where we ended up with is this design here. And switch to this. So it's Form Foundry. Uh, you guys can go visit the website, it's formfoundry.com. Uh, kind of running short on time, but uh, made a body kit. And um, to make it affordable for people, it had to be injection molded because you had to basically increase um, the volume of production. So here's a body kit right here. So not enough time to go really in the details, but the seat comes off, it pivots up, um, and these are all injection molded parts. So, you know, there's really no other way to make a durable uh, part for a motorcycle. That's, we sold these for $470 um, besides injection molding. But the issue is the upfront cost. You have to make these massive tools um, and the the tooling, which is these big steel pieces for injection molding. You now, this, this is almost, over $100,000 of uh, investment required to make all these parts. You know, these are really big parts. You need a piece of steel that, you know, sticks off a couple feet beyond this in all directions. Um, and so, yeah, they would actually went in the mold like this. So they'd pop out like that. Um, this polypropylene, so it's super flexible. These things won't shatter. Tons of consideration here. Um, but, the guy who helped connect us to this project or helped us manufacture these is Daryl LTM Plastics. And uh, once we were done with this project, uh, I started working here at LTM Plastics with Daryl. So all my jobs are kind of just connection to connection to connection. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let Lily go. Sorry, I went a little over. Thank you. Katie, I think, I think you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> um, I just think that's great to hear how you get the jobs, right? I mean, I think that's something important that young people need to know as they're entering a field, right? That's how it all yeah. comes together. Thank you, Eric. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. All right, Lily, let's hand it to when, you. When would you like to do Q and A? I'm saying um, at the. Oh golly, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I was going to do it after you. We'll see if there's time. Like, okay, yeah, first time. Time. let's give this a go. <laughs> All right, I'm going through here and let me start. Okay, can you all see my screen? Nope. Okay. Um, my name is Lily Corna, as you know. I graduated from Metro in 2019. Um, I actually did not 
entirely land at product designer as right out of high school. I lived out of a van and I converted it, you know, it was a small van and that kind of taught me that I wanted to work with my hands. And also I started getting into more woodworking. Um, I was a route setter um, at climbing gyms. So I worked a lot with my hands and that kind of led along to this path where I ended up being a product designer. So also to your high school students, I will say like maybe college is not immediate for you and that's okay. Um, that's one thing that I wish I had embraced earlier was like, sometimes you're not ready and that's, I think, totally fine. Um, and maybe you need time to figure out where you want to go. Um, so I've been at Tule Group um, from 2019 to present. I'm focused on soft goods design, so that's stone products. And then in my free time, I like to climb, backpack, and skiing. Really quick, I'm just going to talk about what it's like, what my project phase is as a soft goods designer. Quick run through a couple of my most uh, earliest projects. I can't show my recent projects because they're not on the market yet. So I'll be focused on some of my first projects. And then a little bit of reflection of some questions to think about as you're considering going into the design space or whether you're considering going into the art space um, as well as the outdoor industry. Um, so I, as I stated earlier, uh, I worked for Thule Group, which also owns the brand Case Logic. We have two brands that design different product categories. Right now, I'm going to be focused mainly on some Thule products, so I'll talk a little bit about that. We are a very large company, um, international, based out of Sweden, um, but we have satellite offices around the world. We have sport and cargo carriers. You've seen those car top boxes. We also do rooftop tents, um, packs, bags, and luggage. That's where I'm focused. We also do um, active juveniles, so that's strollers, things like that. And we're also coming out with a line of pet products soon uh, as well. We have RV products as well. I've designed a couple things for different sport and cargo accessories and same for the children's um, product category, but mainly I'm focused on packs, bags, and luggage. So really a large product category. And the premise for Thule is to bring your life. So wherever you're going, we try to create products that help you bring your life. Um, whether it's going out mountain biking or running or traveling, um, surfing, all of these things, we try to support that. So how do we get to a bag and come up with an idea? And how do we get that to market? How do we develop ideas and sell it all over the world? Uh, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it comes down to to create these products more specifically to what the design portion of the team does. We have a lot of different teams that bring these products to market. So we have kind of the product management team and they kind of, we're the in-house consultants for them and they come up with an idea and they say, hey, we're gonna bring these, we're gonna create a new bag collection and bring it to the market. Here's your user group. And they do these portfolio planning of what their product assortment is gonna be. Then we kick off into design and these are usually about a six to eight week course. And once we start working through the design and we finalize it as a team, we come up with a specification pack, send it to the factory, and then we start getting samples and we go into a development process and eventually we get to production. So this will be the this will look boring, but it's actually really important. I come back to it over and over again. This is literally what we're doing, the five whys. Um, we'll get started, we'll get handed off the design brief. And the design brief essentially is the basic starting block for a project. I picked one of these pages to show because this is the one that I tend to go back to over and over again. So this essentially shows the elevator pitch. Why are we bringing this product to market? What are our goals? Do we want to capture a market group of users? Um, how, what type of bags are you making? Was it a bigger bag or a smaller bag? How many SKUs? Are you doing different colors? How many units am I going to sell? Does that mean that I can put unicorn leather on it or not? So it just, it helps determine what is within the scope of capability. And then also what's really important is our target cost. Dave was mentioning manufacturing. We have to be able to meet a certain target cost because we have a profit margin in mind. Really just realistically of how do you get it to market? Um, and these are all the answers that are on the project design brief. Um, so as soon as I get that, I start diving into research and research can be 
is something that I do ongoing. We do it as a team. So I'll look at stuff online. I'll use Pinterest. I will read, um, I'll look at TikTok. I'll look at Instagram. For those of you that feel like you're wasting time, it's actually good to see what the world's, what's going on in the world. Look at consumer trends. Um, I gather inspiration. So trying to do a little bit of understanding different brands. We'll create user personas. Um, we'll also look at like larger scale trends. Like as you know, during the pandemic, we had a lot of changes and we had a lot of burnout from millennials. I'm an aging millennial. So I was experiencing burnout. It was happening around the world actually. So we were seeing that there were shifting priorities within this larger um, generational group. And we kind of focused on the shift to health and wellness um, rising out of the pandemic. So all of these things kind of help build a case of what the product should be. And once I kind of get an idea of what direction we're going in, I start to brainstorm. So this is a bunch of iterative sketching, thinking about the form of the bag, thinking about where you want the panel breaks to be, the interaction, the style of the bag. So just really getting out all of these rough concepts. Quite often what I'll do is I'll start throwing these concepts on a table. And so I work with a team of four. There are um, it's Anna, Ryan, Chris, and myself, and we do all of the bag design here and we have these team meetings. So we start thinking about all the user interface and really basically like who's the user group um, kind of giving each other critique on these ideas. So we'll do rapid iteration as a team. We'll test the fit of samples we got in. So really just kind of using each other as a sounding board and collaborating and getting a gut check. All of these things are much more informal before we take it to the larger project team and present it in a much more formal way, which leads me to the design reviews. So once we kind of get, all right, I have this collection of styles I'm thinking of, I will typically gather them into concept families based off of a certain style. So if I have two backpacks, two laptop bags, maybe a crossbody sling, I'll say, here's what it'll look like with style A, here's what it'll look like with style B. I'll start hinting at um, you know, some of the material constructions. How does the bag open up? Where do you put your phone? Where do you put your laptop? Things like that. And then I just open it up for discussion and we talk about as a team of what we want to keep, what we want to throw out, and what we want to tweak. And I'll go back to the drawing board and start to do more sketching and start to develop these concepts. During this time, I will also start figuring out what are the materials that we want to use. Obviously, I go back to that design brief. What are our target costs? Can I use really expensive premium material? Maybe not. Who's the user group? Does this need to be light and fast? Is it for hiking? Does it need to be a lightweight fabric? Does it need to be water resistant? Do we want to try and put more sustainable materials? You know, we'll talk about that later um, as far as like finding that balance with what you can, how you can impact the industry. So can we pitch a recycled product to the team and make a case for that? So these are all the things that go into the materials. And near the end of the design process, I go into what's called, I guess I would call it the final design review. It's where I've got my concepts fully refined. Uh, one of those things you'll do is I'll kind of start, this will be on Illustrator. I'll do sketches. I'll take my, I'll start, I start sketching by hand, but then I go into the digital sphere and I do some quick rendering. Um, these things look very, um, might look a little bit more refined, but typically we have these processes to go very quickly as far as applying shadow and shade. And I'll go through this so that I can focus on really working out those small features where the panels intersect, et cetera. So I'm starting to say, OK, where's the logo going to be? Is it going to be reflective silver? Um, what are the key feature sets? What are the final dimensions? I also will create any CAD work. So you can see here, I'm going to have a mouse. This is a hard molded safe zone. So I'll start making the models and SolidWorks, and then as well as applying, creating these full scale orthographics. So these are actually in full scale and we'll send those off to the factory. Another thing I do is I pitch color. So another thing that's really important and also exciting about working in soft goods is you're always trying to understand what's going on in the trends and how consumer mindsets are changing. So it just comes down to observing day to day, seeing what people are doing, what people are wearing, 
And we'll use these mood boards to kind of create a case of why we want to use certain colors. And then I'll mock it up in a backpack to give over a sketch to give the project team an idea of what it might look like in person. Now we've approved the project, we've approved the design, we're ready to go to the factory, and you can't just share a sketch of them and expect them to understand it. I'm usually sending this over to a factory in Asia. There's a language barrier. Uh, so, and there's also the way that they produce the materials there is completely different than just being theoretical. This is kind of like where the rubber heats the road. Um, so it'll be the final concept. I'll have an overview of the main features, all the dimensions, material callouts, pocketing, any specific special types of construction that I need to be taken in consideration, all the labels, logos, and then I'll also send off any um, CAD models as well as the full scale artwork. And I'll just go back and forth um, and get samples from the factory. Uh, I think something that's really important, and Eric was talking about this too, is just being really iterative. So focusing on those smaller details, um, we actually have an in-house sample room. So we have people that will sew up bags for us. So we will have them sew up maybe small details and compare them to see what works best. So it's really about um, focusing on the details. Um, as they say, like there's this Eames quote, I believe the details are the details. They make the design. It's really just paying attention to the little things that goes a long way. And Another thing um, that's really important is as I get these samples, so if you can imagine, I send off my spec pack, the factory processes it, they create patterns from scratch, and I get back my bags one month later. It's very exciting. But then I find out my laptop doesn't fit. I made the pocket too small. Uh, these handles are too short, all types of things. Uh, the stitching is tearing here. So what I'll do is I'll create a red line file, which has each change listed, one per slide, and make it very clear to the factory what I want them to change. And you can imagine that somebody is there, there's a translator who's translating these um, into a different language so that the pattern maker can apply these changes. So really being clear and understanding who you're communicating to is important, got it. Um, now I'm just gonna dive into a couple of the projects that I did uh, closer to the beginning of my time. I did this really fun custom pack for one of our Thule athletes. It's a uh, ski pack that has his crampons and has added straps for his skis. I thought this was really interesting because this guy skis off of cliffs, cliffs and then he pulls a parachute. So he's um, a base jumping skier. I know, wow. I can't wrap my mind around, this, but around it, um, but it's pretty wild. So if you ever look at the video, you can see him ski off a cliff and pull a parachute, um, Matthias Gerard, um, then then. Then the next one is Tuli Lithos. These are just some more heritage style, simple backpacks. We sell about 50,000 of these units per year. So it has a, a larger reach um, all over the world. And then Case Logic Viso, this is the first collection I worked on as a designer. I wish I could have uh, brought my, mod my samples to show just the progression between the first samples to the finals um, samples. But this is kind of uh, our uh, camera bag collection for Case Logic. And then Tuli Accent, I showed some examples of this, and this is just our largest business-oriented bag collection um, at Tuli. And I just wanted to open up this space when we do the Q&A of just thinking about whether you want to go into art, whether you go into commercial. One of the things that you think about is what's really exciting is if you're mass producing, you're reaching a lot of users. So that's one thing that can be really fun is you're reaching a lot of people. Um, but then again, you know, everything I design comes from petroleum. So you have to think about the environmental impact and really if you can implement lasting change uh, with what you're doing, um, as well as like you will see that you have manufacturing limitations. You wanna do something that's really changing, but you have very limited factory costs. Um, and then also social responsibility of thinking about how you can affect change if we're continuing to produce products that are gonna end up in a landfill. So I really like this quote from a book I was reading recently. What do you love? What are you good at? What does the world need? And what can you be paid for? <laughs> um, because at the end of the day, you do need to yeah. be able to live. <laughs> I love um, to sleep, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the last thing I wanted to talk about is just 
considering to think about the sphere that you're entering, we have a huge gap in uh, gender diversity uh, and, and just diversity in general in design. Only 19% of practicing industrial designers are women. But as you know, women influence 90% of um, purchasing decisions. Half of our users are women. So we have a line of products that are designed for women, but not by women. Um, so I really do think we need more women in design. And then another thing is in the outdoor industry, it's also not proportionate to our actual population. And it has to do with access. It has to do with regional. Like if you can get out of the city, there's all huge barriers to access. So thinking about who are your participants? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of rushing this. I want to give you just a moment to talk about this. Um, so I think I just had some reflections that I've had in the year in review. And I would just say for anybody that's going into design is, you know, to be an ally. If you see something, say something. Um, one thing I've learned is like finding your people, considering culture fit. So like think about who you want to work with. That's really important. Um, Think about working with your friends, people that um, understand you, that respect you, and then continuing to grow and learn about these disparities and how we can create a more inclusive environment within design and also within the outdoor industry. Um, yeah, that's that's most of uh, the talk. Great, thanks, Lily. Yeah, I mean, I think it is really important um, in these industries to really think about who's actually participating in them and who's invited or allowed in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully we are um, helping to bring more um, people to more industries as, as part of our goal here. So I think that's really important to talk about. All right, so we have a couple of minutes left and I would love to have some great questions. Um, would you, um, at the top, you can see you can raise your hand if you have a question. Um, so uh, awesome, go ahead, Elliot. And then Lucero, you'll be next. Um, I just had a question about um, when you were in college or when you were starting out with your career, if you had any things that you wanted to push other people to do that you wish you would have done. That's a good question. Starting on our career. Like what would you, if you were giving advice to your younger self, kind of, right, Elliot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say maybe spend time figuring out what you really want to do, not being necessarily pressured to do something. I think um, maybe giving yourself space to take elective classes too. Um, I really enjoyed taking art classes when I was at Metro, printmaking. Um, it took me a while to find design. So definitely and visualizing, right? Because this is what you're gonna be doing every day for hours. So you have to find something that you like. So I think spend time figuring that out. Don't don't just rush into it. Cool. Yeah, I totally agree with Lily. Um, I think another thing that I would tell my younger self is kind of ask, you know, more questions to people who are um, older than me or ahead of me in the programs I'm in or in the industries I'm interested in and just try to, you know, get involved in those, you know, really just try out a bunch of different things and, and see what you like. Because I think, at least for me, college was all about figuring that out, was what, what I'm good at, what I'm inter interested in. Um, and I think once you find a passion of yours, then it's everything kind of becomes easier because you you like doing the design work or you like doing you know x and uh you'll put more time into it and you know it's especially industrial design it's a really competitive industry so if you want to be in this in this industry and i think a lot of industries at a high level then you gotta you gotta be better than most and that's kind of just the, the reality uh so um for industrial design, yeah, figure out what other students are doing, uh, go to conferences, just really get involved and in, uh, yeah, get involved, I'd say. Yeah, I would say I would echo those and also for myself, um, because um, college is limited time, it was four years and um, I would say I wish I would have maybe just focused more and really concentrated. I mean, you do have to have some fun, 
but um, also it's a kind of short time. So um, yeah, just to really learn to focus and kind of uh, use that time really um, concentrated, you know, on your efforts. Great, awesome, thank you. thank you guys. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, Lucero, what was your question? Is she still here? I think you're on mute. Oh, Lucero, you're on mute, yes. <laughs> oh, your mic isn't working. All right, do you want to type it and I can read the question out? Great. Did, did everyone have a snow day? Did everyone have to go to school or was it canceled? We had school. Uh, I was hoping for a snow day, but it never came. So I went down there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah. So this, this question is for Lily. I was wondering how you've incorporated sustainable di design in your work. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one you have to grapple with because not like you go up and everyone shows up and say hey we're we're trying to do this as a team sometimes you have to push for it or advocate within your personal team uh how we've done it uh, one of the ways is doing a lot of research to build buy in your product teams is to like hey we need to do these recycled fabrics i've done some research here's a great recycled fabric that we can use so building a case for that and doing your own homework and pitching that to the product team and also like planting little seeds like I in my mind, if I could do it, it would be completely recycled, but the budget might be limited and you might only be able to get one um, component to be sustainable. And that's when you maybe do that for this project. But the next time they're open to doing more. Another thing you can look at is the factories. Are they blue sign certified? So there's third party certifications that say like this factory actually treats their workers right. And they've also limited their use of water and they're not producing um, or they're minimizing their production of toxic chemicals, right? So it's constantly just, you kind of have to, I just gave you some very like specific examples, but you kind of, I would say, continue to educate yourself and think about what's the next step that I can get my team to go to because you can't get from A to Z. So sometimes you got to like, win small battles progressively. Um, and just learning what's really sustainable. There's a lot of greenwashing out there and really doing your homework of saying like, is this post-industrial, post-consumer? Um, I could go on, but I would say self-education, sharing that news and continuing to, to push for those items. Great question. Um, I was gonna uh, answer a question that was earlier. I saw in the chat about how much is a patent. And I really said a lot. It is a lot. Um, I worked with a couple of patent things, and for like um, an invention, you might have like a phone stand or something. You want to patent it. Um, the full patent can be between five thousand and eight thousand dollars, and a lot of that is paying a lawyer to basically fill out the forms. So if you can kind of find someone who's smart, like a lawyer, and they can fill out a lot of forms. Um, and they could pay less. But the um, initial patent, it's called a provisional patent, it lasts one year. That's only around $70 to get. So you get that first, then you work on it. Then after one year, if you think it's a really good idea, um, five or 8,000, uh, something like that, anyway, from my experience. Are they worth yeah. it all the time? If I can <laughs> chime in on that, we, we for the, the moto kit, for the motorcycle, we've talked about doing that. And um, really like in this current, at least in this plastic industry, it's so easy to replicate things and change one little thing, the holes a square now or something, and they can get past it. Yeah. So a lot of it now is just time to market. So as soon as we said we're doing this design, it's full speed ahead, get it on the market before everyone else. And then, you know, that's your advantage because in China too, when your when your tools and designs are there, people, you know, it's a it's another company or they're outsourcing the work to another company there. 
and people can steal designs. You see like Oakley knockoffs and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, for for this industry, it's a lot of just time and market. And no one even bothers with the money for a patent. Yeah. yeah. And the small and and one small thing on that, and then I wanted to hear Asia's question. But a lot of times you do non disclosure, so like a factory could agree not to share your work, or you do non disclosure, like I can't show you stuff because of non disclosure. Eric couldn't show stuff for Boeing because of non disclosure. So sometimes they're legally binding items. Um, but, and then there's also, I mean, we can talk about patents another time. There's so much about it. Um, um, but yeah, that's, that's another thing to consider. Um, awesome. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Asia, what, what, what's your question? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so this like designing a product, it sounds like there's like a lot of like skills you need like marketing um design itself like maybe like engineering um so what classes do you take to like um like for the major to like design these products or does like everybody in the team who are who are making the product do they all have like different skill sets yeah it, I think it depends on the scale that you work at. Um, Eric is in a smaller company, so he probably does a different variety of special. I'll let Eric answer that part. But like where I am, I only do design work. So I don't do any marketing, photography. I don't do any development. I will just say like, hey, I like this, you know, Swatch. Can you find this for me? And then there's a developer that goes to a sourcing team. So we have a sourcing team that finds stuff. We have a sourcing team that negotiates pricing with a factory. So um, it just depends on how big your team is if you're just doing design. But I think mm -hmm. taking classes can help if you wanna do an engineering focus. You know, you wanna work with injection molded parts, you can take, you can do a minor in mechanical engineering. Those often go hand in hand and you can look into that. Um, if you wanna do something more in the art space, maybe you take more art classes and product design classes. So always explore your interests. But I think the really the biggest thing for design, I would say is your design process and building that process. Like how do you get a problem and how do you solve it? Um, and just building a lot of user empathy because you're not going to be designing for yourself. You're going to be designing for somebody else in a totally different position. So I think it's just like how to put yourself in someone's shoes and think about what they really need. Yeah, I think a piece of advice I'd have, uh, you know, I think school kind of shows you the tools and and gives you an intro, but uh, to be a professional at anything, it's it's a lot of work on your own. Um, so I, if I was trying to figure out what classes to take, I'd find oh, I'm interested in car design. So and I did this when I was in school. I messaged some people on LinkedIn who worked at car companies and said, what CAD software do you use or, you know, I think reaching out to professionals and, and getting what they actually use day to day or skills that's valuable to them, then you can kind of apply that in the school setting. Um, and then for Form Foundry, I had to do literally everything myself. I created the website, I did the marketing, um, did the graphics design, and that was all just, you know, YouTube education uh, and a lot of trial and error and time. So. Uh, you know, you can pretty much learn anything with the internet. You just got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what I'd say about that is, um, like design is your main thing. So your skill with drawing and creativity and that, but um, to know enough to talk to people from the other apart uh, departments, so you're not like alien them. So, oh, I'm only an artist and I only talk about this. You should be able to be friendly and communicate with the business person and with the people in the factory and the marketing team and all that, like to be a team player. So just to know a little, like you would expect them to know a little about what you do. So, you know, like that, so just recommendation. Yeah. And I yeah. saw a question, is it difficult to break into? And the, the answer is definitely yes. And Lily, I'm not sure how many people from our program work mm. professionally, but it's probably less than half of people who graduate with us Work yeah. as an industrial designer, um, I guess. To be to be frank, I will say for Metro, the strength of Metro is we have an awesome facility with a bunch of machines and really cool tools. And really, if you want to just get in there and start making stuff, there's so many resources at your disposal. But one thing that Metro lacks 
not Metro State, but the ID program is connections to design groups in major companies. And I see other schools that have a really good co-op program or things like that. And they are much, they have much more access. So I think that's the problem, right? Of the design is all about access to that industry. Yeah, and yeah. like Eric was saying, leveraging connections. Um 80% of jobs are found through networking. So I think a lot of that is just like, you might have to market yourself and put yourself out there and just think about those things um, before you go to school too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You need the skills to do the work, but then you also need the connections to be able to, to get mm -hmm. the jobs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Great. Well, thank you so much and appreciate your staying a little longer, um, everybody. Um, so great questions, um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about it um, in um, with the interns going forward. Um, but I really appreciate your um, talking about what you do. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. This was this was a pleasure. Great. My pleasure. Good questions, awesome. you guys. That was yeah, great. yeah, yeah. If there's any more questions, you know, email. You can Good. email one of us to forward it to me or Lily. Happy yeah, to answer. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, and, if information. and if you ever want to come down to school for a tour of the school or something, that'd be fun. I Absolutely. highly recommend it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we'll get it this year. Oh, it's been a crazy year, but we yeah. definitely have it on the horizon. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Good Thanks, night. Bye, everyone. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.